And we are live. Okay, just make sure everything is up and running. Hey there, how's it going? It is Lee Hayward back again with another live video Q&A. Now, this is something that I do every Friday afternoon for the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. So if you are a regular to these video chats, I want to welcome you back. And if you could do me the favor of letting me know if you can hear me and see me and if this is coming through loud and clear, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, if you're brand new to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel and you're just joining us for the first time, I want to welcome you. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, got a frog in my throat. Uh, basically, the way these chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here for the next hour and answering any questions that you may have with regards to bodybuilding and fitness, exercise and nutrition, any specific challenges that you may be dealing with. Feel free to post those in the chat window and I'll do my best to help you out in any way that I can. Now, I know for some people who are, are new to these video chats, you're probably saying, well, why should I ask Lee Hayward any questions? Um, uh, first off, I don't claim to be a, an expert or, or a guru or anything like that, but one thing that I do have under my belt is I've been involved with the fitness industry for over 20 years, and I love helping people, and I have coached thousands of people over that past 20 years, and I've gained a, a few insights along the way. So what I'm going to do over these video chats is share some of my insights and basically try and help you when it comes to working around some of these challenges that you may be dealing with. Now, again, I, I don't claim to have all the answers, and if I don't have an answer for you, I'll be upfront and honest and let you know that I don't have the answers you're looking for, and I'll probably try and suggest somewhere else that you can go and look for those answers. But if I can help you with anything that you're working on, then by gosh, I'm going to try my best to do that during this video chat over the next hour. So I've got a couple little things I want to organize here from my end. And while I'm doing that, you can go ahead and type in any questions or comments of discussion in our chat window. Just wanted to cover that because I know uh, I had some of the feedback towards one of my previous chats uh, last week. People say, well, why should anybody ask you any questions? You're not an expert. And I say, I've never ever claimed to be an expert. It's just, you know, I guess once you've been doing something for 20 years, you've kind of learned a thing or two along the way. And uh, I know some people can find that beneficial. So that's why I'm doing these video chats. All right, we have Jesse joining us. We have Jerry is joining us. AV Bullet Catcher is joining us. And everyone's saying it's coming through loud and clear. I appreciate that, guys. We have Railroad Hill. Uh, Nima is joining us. Okay, great stuff. Really appreciate that, folks. Thank you much. All right, let's jump into some questions. Nima's asking, uh, do you think it is possible to do a clean bulk on a 16 by 8 intermittent fasting diet, three meals every four hours, 1,000 calories each? One thing I'm going to ask is why do you want to bulk with intermittent fasting? It's... It's kind of counterintuitive. I mean, can you do it? Is it possible? I guess it's possible. I mean, try it and see how your body responds. But intermittent fasting is basically a strategy to reduce the amount of food and calories that you consume over a 24-hour period. Bulking, on the other hand, is the whole idea of it is to increase the amount of calories and nutrition that you consume over a 24-hour period in order to put yourself in a caloric surplus. So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. Now, I know some people out there will try and bulk with an intermittent fasting approach, and, and maybe some people make it work for them. And if they do, hey, more power to them. I'm not, I'm not going to knock it. If, if somebody's doing it and it's working, then by all means. But I'm just looking at it from a common sense point of view. If your goal is to bulk up, then make it easier on yourself and have more meals and a larger feeding window throughout the day to make it easier to get that calorie surplus in. If your goal is fat loss and restricting calories, then you can do an intermittent fasting approach where you shorten that feeding window and it just makes it easier to restrict the number of calories that you consume over a 24 hour period. So I personally would not follow an intermittent fasting diet if I was trying to bulk up. And I just don't think it's, it's the, it, it's just counterintuitive. I would rather make it easier on myself, have, 
fewer, smaller meals, and that would just make it that much more manageable. And I think anybody who has ever followed a true bulk up program before realizes how hard it is. I mean, it, it, it's not fun to be in a big caloric surplus, and it's not fun to be in a big caloric deficit. It's fun to be in the middle where you're eating till you're comfortably full. That's what's fun. That's what's enjoyable. If you have to go into a caloric surplus to gain weight, that's just as uncomfortable from a different aspect as it is to go into a caloric deficit to lose weight. So you kind of just want to tip the scales in favor of whatever it is that you're actually trying to work towards. And I think, again, intermittent fasting is not a bulk of program. Okay, one other question. You have Daniel is joining us, and he's asking, how are you? I saw that you are intermittent fasting. <laughs> intermittent fasting is hot topic today. Uh, I says, what is the best way to break a fast? Anything in particular should I be eating or not eating? Not really. I mean, there's there's nothing magical about intermittent fasting. I mean, if, if well, I personally break my fast, I mean, just I, I basically just bump my meals ahead. So if, if I want to have my breakfast meal, then I'll have that, you know, early in the afternoon or, or whenever it is that I break my fast. Uh, sometimes, depending on the, the way things are going, like if we have a big family dinner planned, I may fast all the way till dinner, and then that kind of gives me more room to enjoy that family dinner and still stay within my caloric restrictions that I have or my caloric guidelines that I have. So th there's really nothing, you know, a, a one particular meal that you have to break your fast with or anything like that. Uh, the main thing is just look at the good quality nutrition. I mean, you still want to eat the same type of foods if you're following an intermittent fasting program as if you were following like a a bodybuilding bro diet eating you know clean uh, natural unprocessed foods the only thing is is you're just going to be shortening your feeding windows to make it easier to restrict those calories so again as, as far as the foods are concerned you're still gonna eat the same basic foods as if you were eating you know the typical six meal a day bodybuilding diet it's just that you're going to squeeze those into a shorter feeding window if you want some sample foods and some sample suggestions for this, head on over to my website, leehayward.com, and you can download a copy of Bodybuilding Nutrition Made Simple. This is a free ebook guide that I've put together. Uh, again, leehayward.com. You go there on the side menu bar, you'll see it. I have a bunch of other free ebooks that you can download. But this covers the fundamentals of bodybuilding nutrition. And that covers some good guidelines, and you can impl impl <laughs> you can apply those to an intermittent fasting program just the same as you can apply it to any type of bodybuilding program. Uh, Jesse is joining us. What are your thoughts on the carnivore diet? I've never truly tr tried the carnivore diet. I've tried variations of ketogenic diet, um, which borderlines the, the, the carnivore diet, at least the way that I was following it, borderlined it, but I would still have some uh, green vegetables in there as well. The carnivore diet, from, from my understanding of it, again, I haven't done a whole lot of research on it, but I have heard of it. I've, I've heard some people talking about it through podcasts and things of that nature. I've seen some YouTube videos. Is, is basically you're eating all animal products, you know, so meat, fish, eggs, you know, all pure animal products base products there's no vegetable products in there are no plant-based products in there at all it's just all meat based and the theory is well you can get all the nutrition you need from meat and it's going to help you blah 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 it, the arguments i guess pro carnivore diet are very similar to the arguments for a pro keto diet and um, personally for a short-term fat loss thing I, I think it could work i mean i know a lot of competitive bodybuilders who have followed a variation of the carnivore diet to get like super shredded for competition. I mean, I, I've heard some crazy stories like guys eating nothing but fish for three months in order to get, you know, in peak contest condition and, and you know, stuff like that. I mean, that is extreme hardcore. And yes, it may work from a fat loss point of view, but from a health, fitness and lifestyle point of view, I, I don't think it's, it's a long-term eating strategy personally. Now, I know there's going to be some people probably comment and say, oh, well, I've been following the carnivore diet for the past 25 years and it's working great for me. Well, if that's the case, hey, more power to you. I tip my hat to you. But I think for the average person and for me personally, I don't think it is a lifestyle diet. I think it would be suitable for like a short-term fat loss program, 
but I think for a lifestyle diet, for the majority of people, having a well-balanced nutrition, a well-balanced in your macros so that you're getting, say, like a third of your calories from protein, a third of your calories from carbohydrates, a third of your calories from good quality fat, and try and have some diversity in those foods and in, within those macros. So, I mean, like, for example, with the with the uh, you know the, the carbohydrates, for example, you make sure that you're getting a, a well balanced of good complex carbs and lots of vegetables in order to get the the vitamins and the phytonutrients that you need. Same with your protein. Same with your fats. I mean, you know, make sure that you have a, a broad spectrum of fats in there. Some saturated fats, some you know uh, unsaturated fats. Getting the omega threes in there, so you get all the well balanced nutrition. And and I personally think well balanced nutrition trumps all these other type of diets for the majority of people again i know there's going to be exceptions to the rule but if you look at like 80 percent of the people like say like the 80 20 rule 80 percent of the people are going to function on a well-balanced diet and then you're going to have some of these outskirts like say 20 percent of the people who are going to function really well on like a really low carb diet some are going to function really well on an extremely high carb diet and, and all these different extreme diet variations but most people are going to function their best on a well-balanced diet. And that's where I find that I function my best. And if I'm coaching somebody personally, we'll start off with a well-balanced diet. And again, nine out of 10 times, that is moving them in the right direction towards their fitness goals. And in some situations, depending on what it is that they're training for, I mean, for example, if it's a bodybuilder getting ready for a competition or something like that, we may experiment with some of these more extreme diet strategies to help speed up their fat loss. But for the most part, well-balanced diet and, and just consistency over the long term is, is what works the best for most people. I know well-balanced doesn't sound sexy, especially when you have all these extreme diets out there, but it works. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes it doesn't have to be sexy or extreme to work. <laughs> and that's that's just the truth of the matter. Anyway, let's move on, see what other questions we've got. Uh, Jerry's joining us. Any advice on staying motivated? He says, I'm currently in college and I could only hit the gym at 6 a.m., but sometimes I can't really find motivation. Well, really have to make it work for, for you and your situation. I mean, if 6 a.m. happens to be the time that you can allocate to going to the gym, then, hey, <laughs> 6 a.m. it is. And, and I'm going to tell you from... My personal experience from, from working in, in gyms throughout the years and, and just knowing people in the fitness industry, sometimes the most consistent people that I know of, I'm, I'm thinking about some people that I know of who I'm, I've been coaching for years, uh, they are early morning workout enthusiasts. I mean, like first thing in the morning, they'll go to the gym, they'll do their workout, then they'll go to work or then they'll go to school or whatever it is they have to do for that day. And a lot of times the morning uh, gym goer is the most consistent because it's, it's like clockwork. I mean, sometimes these guys, you can set your watch by them as they walk in the gym door every single morning. And th it's good because they get in that habit. They get in that ritual where they're going to do their workout first thing in the morning, get it done, get it out of the way before the rest of the day, you know, throws responsibilities at them. I mean, if, if you work out later in the day, which you still can, don't get me wrong. I mean, if a lot of people work out later in the day and still make it work, but it can be sometimes more challenging because you have other responsibilities coming at you. You know, like people at work or at school and, and projects and, uh, and everything else just coming at you. And then you find that these things are just drawn on your attention all day long. Whereas if you get your workout done first out of the way, then once you get into school or work or whatever and these other responsibilities come at you, it, it's not going to take away from your training because that's already done and over with. So the fact that you can work out at 6 a.m. is not necessarily a bad thing. That may be a blessing in disguise and it may be the, the thing that's going to help keep you consistent over the long term. So sometimes when we have these challenges come up, all we really need to do is, is reframe them in our mind and look where is the advantage in this challenge versus how is this a burden? You know, and so in the case of having to work out first thing in the morning, I, I'd actually look at that as, as an advantage, not as a, a, a disadvantage. We have AV Bullet Catcher. Are you or have you 
ever been a licensed personal trainer? Yes, I've been a personal trainer. I used to work at uh, the gym. Uh, I, I worked at a couple of gyms. I uh, used to, for, for years, I was a personal trainer at the YMCA. Uh, I did that for years. That's where I started out. And then we had a local gym uh, here that I worked at for, for a while back in the day. This is back in back in the early 2000s or so. That's when I was doing a lot of training in the gym as a personal trainer. Uh, then as my online business started to grow and I also have real estate business, I got away from the personal training side of things. Now, I still do it from time to time, but it's not like a, a, you know nine to five, Monday to Friday type of thing. If, if I go in and train people now, it's it's on a, a rare exception you know that I, that I will do it. But it's, most of my coaching and training now is done over the phone and done online because what I find most people don't need a trainer in there counting their sets and reps for them. They need a coach who can help guide them with the bigger picture of what's going on, the bigger picture of in terms of manipulating their training and their nutrition program and overseeing their progress and help guide them in the right direction and to strategize uh, different approaches that may work for them and, and their body type and their situation, of course, what it is they're working towards. Uh, the whole idea of a personal trainer it can be very beneficial for someone who's new. Like if you've never been in the gym before and you're walking around like, I don't know how to do the exercises. I'm, I'm intimidated. I need help. Yes, absolutely. Get a personal trainer, you know, have someone go around. And I've done hundreds of those type of beginner initiation sessions, you know, taking people through their very first workout. I've done that hundreds, if, if not thousands of times over the years. And that's very helpful that for, 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 for a beginner, that is critical. They need that help. But if you're working with someone who's a bit more advanced, who's already been through that initiation phase, uh, I, I find that going in there and holding their hand and counting their sets and reps for them, it's, for, for the most part, it's, it's a waste of time. Like, I mean, most people do not need that unless it's kind of, I'm not going to go to the gym unless I have my trainer show up for the, the accountability. I can understand that side of it. But for the most part, you just need someone to oversee your progress once you're beyond that initial beginner phase. And, that, and that's what I specialize in. I help oversee people's progress through online coaching and through phone coaching and, and customized program design. Uh, Wood Yellows is joining us. He's asking, can you get enough fiber on a keto diet? Uh, if you structure the diet properly, you can. I mean, there's a lot of high fiber vegetables that you could uh, eat. You could also supplement fiber supplements, you know, like Metamucil and, and different types of fiber supplements if needed. And in the past, when I have followed a ketogenic diet, that's what I used to do uh, because I found that I wasn't getting enough fiber. Uh, but you know, what I found to be even better uh, as I've kind of evolved with my diet is if I'm training for a serious fat loss phase, I will eat more vegetables. I will actually eat a lot of green vegetables. And technically, the amount of vegetables that I would consume would probably bump me out of ketosis. So it wouldn't be a ketogenic diet, but it would be a low carb diet. And I found that that was uh, more advantageous for me. So like in the last several times that I've dieted down for bodybuilding competitions, that's what I actually did. And I found that it actually allowed me to get in my best shape ever by following a low carb diet, but not a ketogenic diet because I was eating so much uh, volume of green vegetables that I know it was bumping me out of, out of ketosis. And I even tested that, you know, peeing on those little ketone sticks and stuff. I, I would not be in ketosis. And I find that in order to truly get there, you have to be very low carb. I mean, very low with the, the uh, vegetables. And you even got to be low with the protein as well, because if you eat too much protein, that's going to convert to glucose and it's going to bump you out of ketosis. So, I mean, a, a ketogenic diet is really a, a, a fat-based diet. And again, it works for some people, but I, I'm not a huge fan of it myself. I prefer more protein, more vegetables, and uh, not so extreme with the fat. Again, that well-balanced nutrition, like I mentioned about earlier. E C uh, E sorry E M A M uh, Emica Computer Emica. I think that's how you pronounce your your username. Says he's 57 years old, 166 pounds, five foot eight, 20 percent body fat, eats 2,200 calories per day, weights and cardio four to five times. 
weights and cardio four to five times per day. I think he must mean per week. I don't think anybody's doing weights and cardio four to five times a day. Um, I can't lose any body fat. Any suggestions? I can't live on 1,100 calories a day. Well, you're not eating 1,100 calories a day. Um, I would really need to, to I mean, I, just based on those numbers alone, I mean, yes, I can kind of start throwing out theories and ideas, but ultimately, if, if you would like some help with this, I'm going to suggest that you book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. And this is something that I do for free where we can actually discuss your situation over the phone because there's, there's, that's a, such a loaded question, right? I mean, in order for me to really answer that, I, I, I need a 20-minute conversation with you back and forth. It's not just something I can say, oh, do this, do that, right? More cardio, less food, <laughs> or whatever. It's, it, it goes a lot deeper than that. So if you would like some help, I'd be more than willing to uh, jump on the phone and, and have a conversation with you. And all you have to do is head on over to my website, leehayward.com. In the top menu bar, you'll see a link there that says coaching. Click on that and you can sign up for a free 20-minute coaching call with me. So you just fill out a little uh, questionnaire outlining what it is that you're, you're doing, what it is that you're trying to achieve. And then once you uh, submit that, you can go then and book uh, a time slot with me. Uh, in your time zone, I, I use a, a calendar feature. So I mean, you'll choose the time in in your time zone, which will then convert to my time zone, and we'll sync up and we'll we'll have a phone conversation and we'll discuss some strategies that you can use to help move you in the right direction towards your fat loss goals. And again, that's open to anybody, anyone listening to this. If you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me, I do offer that. No strings attached, no obligations. I mean, if, if you if you want, we can work together on a coaching program. If you don't and you just want to have a 20-minute conversation and never talk to me again, we can do that too, all right? There's no obligation. It's just an opportunity for us to get to know each other. And if you would like some more help, hey, I'll be more than willing to do that. But if you don't want any help from me, then that's cool as well. So again, do that and then we'll be able to figure out some strategies for your situation. Uh, Swires 86, I keep hearing you should shrug on the overhead press lockout, yet no one seems to be actually doing it. Is it really necessary or no? I've personally never shrug on the overhead press lockout, so I guess no. Uh, when it comes to shrugs, uh, I'm just thinking, do I have a copy of this? The shrug is, is much more than just a shoulder shrug. Right, like you, you see that exercise, you know, barbell shrugs or dumbbell shrugs. The shrugging mo motion can be applied to so many things. And um, there was a book written. It was called, I believe, the Kelso Shrug Book. If I'm not mistaken, it's an older book. It's been around for for twenty plus years. I ha I have a copy of it somewhere, but I, I don't know where it's to off the top of my head. I mean, it's probably down on the bookshelf, stashed away somewhere. But it goes into all kinds of different shrug variations that you can do, and it's something that you can apply to your training to basically either bring up stubborn areas or to enhance certain lifts. So, for example, if you're doing overhead shoulder presses, you can also do an overhead shrug with the barbell. You can, um, if, if you're doing like bench presses, you can lock out the, the bar on the bench press and just shrug and actually activate the chest, the shoulders, and and build all these stabilizer muscles by just doing the shrugging motion. You don't actually have to bend your limbs. The same with rowing exercises. You can go through shrugging variations with rowing exercises, and you'll find that it's just uh, another exercise variation that you can include with your workouts. Now, I mean, sometimes you might want to pair it up with some exercises you're already doing. For example, if you're already doing shoulder presses, then you can finish off with some shoulder press shrugs. Uh, if you're already doing bench presses, you can do bench press shrugs or you're doing rows, you can do rowing shrugs uh, or, or, you know, you, you can have a separate workout where you're just going to do a shrug workout, right? There, there's, all I'm saying, it's just another dimension that you can add into uh, your exercise repertoire. Uh, and, and basically what I would recommend it is use it for some stubborn areas that you're trying to build up. It doesn't necessarily have to be something you do for every single exercise or every single workout, but it's just another tool in the training toolbox, so to speak. But uh, again, it, it's not something that's, you know, mandatory by any means to make progress. I mean, most people do not do this type of shrugging in their workouts and they still make progress.
Uh, Daniel is joining us. He says he has similar goals to myself. Is there any chance you can make a video of a full day of eating from your perspective? Yes, that is something that is on my to-do list. I've had several people ask me for full day of eating videos. Um, the, the challenge with that, <laughs> it, 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 for me anyway, it, is I find that my eating and that when I'm dealing with my son and stuff, it's here I am trying to prepare a meal, trying to look after my son. And, and of course, he eats with us. You know, we always have family meal time together. Holding a video camera and, and dealing with a baby doesn't jive well together. So I, I will do it. I mean, it's, it's definitely something. But I found that since uh, uh, we've had Herbie, it's been a lot harder to make videos because we just can't break up the camera and, and you know drop everything in video as easily as we could before him. So he, he takes priority. And I'm just thinking mealtime, trying to, to situate him as well as prepare a meal and juggle a video camera. It, it will be done, but it, it's just it's just more challenging. It's more challenging than it used to be. And, and Wood Yellow's got another follow-up question. Any more cooking videos coming in the pipeline? Yes. And that's the reason why you usually don't see as many cooking videos is because it's just it, it's just not practical. I mean, if for, for those of you who are parents and you know have, have young children at home. Imagine trying to prepare the meals, look after your kids, and also videotape yourself in the process. <laughs> it's not always easy to do. Uh, okay, what else we got? We have Raj joining us, Prince joining us, asking, how do you break through a plateau? Well, what kind of plateau are you in? I'm, I'll let you elaborate on that question, and we'll, we'll probably get back to it later. It could be like a fat loss plateau, a muscle building plateau, a strength plateau. There's there's a lot of plateaus, and there's different strategies for all of them. Swires got a, is asking, when building a strong bench, would you recommend using leg drive in the novice intermediate stages? Yes, I personally recommend uh, using a good setup and emphasizing leg drive in order to increase your bench. Now, I know there are some other strategies where people like to do uh, the bench without leg drive, like some guys will use like the floor press. Uh, some people will even bench press with their feet up in the air. Uh, I was never a fan of that, but I know some people do it. Uh, but if you want a good, strong bench, it starts with a solid foundation, and that includes setting your feet. That's the first thing you do. In fact, when you're doing any exercise, you always start with your feet. Set your feet and build the foundation from the feet up. And again, that applies with the bench press. And if, if you do that and you get that down path, you will see your, your strength will improve just from that alone. I mean, if, if, I, if I take someone who's just doing a half-ass bench press now, like no leg drive, you know, and, and then set them up properly, they'll probably set a personal record on day one, just learning how to get some good leg drive and a good solid base under themselves when they bench. So uh, yeah, definitely. We want to focus on the technique first. And for those of you who would like some help with that, I actually have a video, How to Bench Press More Weight with Proper Technique. That's the exact title of it. If you do a YouTube search for Lee Hayward, How to Bench Press More Weight with Proper Technique, you'll see that video. It's an older video of mine, but it's, it's one of my more popular videos. I'm, it's got over a million views, and uh, it's, it covers the bench press you know, step-by-step -step breakdown, and it also shows how to do the lift from different angles. And I, I break it down from body position to leg drive, uh, grip, you know, how to tuck your elbows, arch your back, all that kind of stuff. It's it's a pretty pretty well put together video. It's an older one, but again, the the, the tips apply just as well today as it did back then. Uh, would you agree it is wise to rather make exercises harder, for example, with pauses, close grips, etc.? And if yes, what other modifications would you recommend? That all depends on the situation and what it is you're trying to achieve. Sometimes I like to make exercises harder. Sometimes I like to make them easier. And, and again, it really depends on the exercise, the situation, etc. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Let's say that we have, we're, we're doing barbell curls and you have a bit of elbow tendonitis. And so when you lift extra heavy, it flares up that elbow tendonitis. And this, this could apply to any exercise. I just said barbell curls for the, for the hell of it. But 
if, if you have some joint pain, sometimes I will do variations or slow down the tempo uh, or, or you know, hold the peak contraction or whatever and try and make that exercise harder with less weight so that I'm not placing as much strain on the joints. So I, I will often do that. Um, you know, for, for example, leg extensions. This is a prime uh, example of something that I actually do in my own training. Rather than trying to lift as heavy as I can with the leg extension, I will use a moderate weight and really go through a slow and controlled motion, slow and controlled tempo, hold that peak contraction and purposely try and flex and squeeze my quads at the top of each repetition so that I'm getting as much or if not more muscle activation with less weight. And I find by doing that, it doesn't place any strain on the knee joint, but I'm still getting a good workout in the quads. And so I'll use that for any time that I'm working around any exercises or, or joint pain or something like that. Now, sometimes if I'm doing a big power lift, like a, a bench press or, or a, a deadlift or something like that, or a squat, I'm not going to exaggerate the, the slow control aspect. I'll probably be a bit more explosive and actually modify my technique so that I can handle the most weight with that exercise. So it really depends on what it is that you're trying to achieve. More often than not, with a, an isolation exercise, uh, I'll probably be stricter and try and make that exercise harder to isolate the muscle. Uh, a lot of times if I'm doing a big, heavy, compound power move, I may be a bit more explosive because I want to generate as much power as I can from that exercise. So again, that's generally how I do it, but there, of course there's exceptions to all rules. Um, for example, if, if you've got shoulder issues, you probably don't want to be explosive with your bench press because you probably blow out your shoulder. Right. So, I mean, you, you want to be smart about it and listen to your body. But you know, those are some general guidelines that I will incorporate in my own training from time to time. Jesse is joining us. How long should one be doing a strength focused routine? I know you recommend switching it up every four to six weeks, but is it possible to stretch it out as long as it works for me? Exactly. You stretch it out for as long as it's working for you. If, if you're following a strength program or, or any program, and you're making gains, you're enjoying the program, why are you gonna stop after four weeks or six weeks or, or any predetermined time frame? I would ride that wave of momentum for as long as you can. I mean, if you can make steady gains for 12 weeks, for 16 weeks, or however, however long it is, I mean, I would just stick it out for as long as you're making gains and for as long as you are enjoying the program. Once it gets to the point where your gains slow down and your motivation for the program starts to dwindle, then it's time to change things up. And a lot of times you will notice that your gains and your motivation go hand in hand. If you're making gains, your motivation is through the roof. If you're not making gains, your motivation is kind of dwindling. So they go hand in hand. I mean, if, if you're getting bored with your workouts, your progress is going to slow down very slow, very, very soon after that or vice versa. I mean, if, if your progress slows down, you're going to get bored very soon after that. So again, that's why I like to use the actual gains in the gym in terms of like seeing strength gains and, and progressive overload and all that, as well as your motivation, your enthusiasm for the workout, because both are correlated and you will see the, you know, that, that correlation with both of them. So that's what I'd recommend. Ride it out for as long as you're making progress with it. And once you get to that point where you see that the progress is slowed down or you're even backtracking, now you can't even match the lifts that you used to make, then it's time to change things up and do something different. Uh, Jerry's got a comment there saying, thanks for the great advice as always. Much appreciated, Jerry. You're welcome. Um, Swire's got another question. Should you actually squeeze your chest on the bench press or is this just a meme? Really depends what you're training for. If you're trying to just power up as much weight as you can and for, from a powerlifting point of view, no, I really wouldn't overemphasize the squeezing of the chest. If your goal is to isolate it from like a bodybuilding point of view and you just want to get a good pump in the chest, you could try it. Um, but personally, when, I, when I'm doing a bench press, I'm, I'm just thinking like it, it's not the type of movement that really works well for a squeeze. Now some, I mean, your muscles will, will be squeezing and, and contracting under the tension of the exercise itself, but it's not like an isolation exercise. Like let's say like a pec deck fly or a cable crossover fly, 
where you can really squeeze and feel those muscles contracting as you're doing the exercise. Again, it's more of a power move. So personally, I like to say this, the squeezing and the, and the isolation for the isolation exercises, the big compound lifts, I just like to focus on doing them with proper form and trying to generate as much force as I can. So, for example, like if I'm doing squats, I'm not going to try and squeeze my quads throughout the entire exercise or anything like that. I mean, the, the quads are going to be under tension, just the fact that you have a barbell on your back and you're doing squats. But I don't need to like over exaggerate the squeezing and this, the, 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 you know, the flexing and the peak contraction or anything like that during the squat. I mean, I'm just going to let the weight and the exercise and, and proper technique take care of that for me. Then when I get into some of the isolation stuff, that's when you can do the, the squeezing and the pumping and the, you know, the over-exaggerate, the slow and controlled tempo and all that stuff. What do you think of weighted planks? Uh, shoot, there we go. Again, I, I, I flick my mouse and I, and I skip a whole bunch of questions there. So where was I? Weighted planks. There we go. Okay. Um, I personally am not a big fan of weighted planks. I love the plank. Just a regular plank exercise, and I'll often do that at the end of a workout for working the whole abdominal core area. But I'm not really into weighted planks. Um, I mean, if if you want to try it, by all means, do it. But I think body weight alone is is more than enough for most people when it comes to abdominal training. I mean, the abdominals are basically just stabilizer muscles for your core. You don't really need to train them in in a progressive overload fashion with with heavy resistance. The same as you would, like you know, your 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 big heavy compound lifts, right? Nobody's is asking you know, like, how much weight can you plank, or you know, how much weight can you bench? Yeah, they're asking you that, but they're not asking how much can you plank. <laughs> so, uh, I I usually just do higher volume, uh, more time under tension. That in the abdominal exercises, that's where I'll focus on the squeezing and the contracting and the isolating and all that kind of stuff, uh, to, in order to. Uh, work them because those are basically stabilizer muscles and I find that they respond better that way for the big heavy compound lifts That's where I'm going to add resistance and, and try and, and increase the workload that way uh, Michael is joining us Bickle, Michael. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, but uh, the question is I have a, gaz a, a gang ganglion cyst on my wrist. I think that I have uh, might be pronouncing this wrong, but I have a cyst on my wrist that, remind, that rhymes. Um, after a workout for a while, wrist started hurting first, and later I noticed a bump on the back of my wrist. What should be done to recover from this? I'm not familiar with cysts on the wrists. If you have any issues like that, I will go to uh, your doctor or, or some sort of dermatologist or skin care specialist or someone who, who knows this stuff better. I, I, mean, I don't have any experience with cysts to and how to remove them or deal with them. But I can see how that would definitely be a problem for your, your weight training workouts, especially if you're, you're you're getting this, you know, breaking out after your training. Uh, Maza is joining us. Lee, ha, how would you say BCAs are worth it? Or sorry, would you say BCAs are worth it? It's optional. Branch chain amino acids or essential amino acids. You'll find a lot of people today are recommending essential amino acids over the branch chains just because it's, you're covering more of your basis in terms of amino acids. I mean, the branch chain amino acids are basically just three key amino acids that are required for building muscle. The essential amino acids are all nine of the essential amino acids that your body cannot manufacture on its own. Uh, a lot of people nowadays are saying, hey, we we should probably be better off supplementing with the essential amino acids versus the branch chain amino acids, which again, makes sense. I, I haven't actually studied it. Like I'm not in the laboratory, like, okay, well, subject A did a workout with branch chain amino acids and subject B did a workout with essential amino acids and who has more protein synthesis after their workout. I haven't been in the laboratory to do that, but just from a common sense point of view, it kind of makes sense that maybe the essential amino acids would probably be, be better because, again, you're getting more amino acids. Anyway, back to your question. Are they worth it? It's 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 really optional. And, I mean, you can make progress without supplementing amino acids. So, so don't use this as, like, an excuse to not push yourself in the gym or to not train or say, well, 
gee, I'm not taking amino acids, so there's no point. No, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You can still build muscle, have protein synthesis, and go through the whole process by just eating adequate protein intake through your natural food. Your body will break down that food and, and extract the amino acids and, and top up your amino acid pool and send those amino acids to your muscles for growth and recovery. It'll do all that even if you don't take an amino acid supplement. It'll just break down the food that you eat to get the amino, the amino acids it needs. Now, you can speed up the process a little bit and kind of tip the scales in favor of an anabolic edge, if you will, if you take amino acids while you train, before or after intense activity right before during or after right in that window of the high intensity activity if you supplement with an amino acid supplement that is very rapidly digested and absorbed it just helps to speed up the, the process of getting those amino acids to your muscles so that they can use them for recovery and growth again it can help but is it absolutely necessary no so the way i look at it if you are really serious about your training you're really pushing it and you are doing everything you can to kind of maximize your progress then this is one more thing that you can do to maximize your progress if you're kind of half-assed with your workouts and working out on and off again and you know yes you'd like to make some progress but it's not you're not really pushing yourself you're more of that weekend warrior type of person then i really don't think amino acids are are, gonna, are worth it in that situation so use your own discretion like a serious athlete, competitive bodybuilder, someone who's really pushing their limits of recovery, yeah, they're going to see a noticeable difference from it. The weekend warrior who's on and off again in the gym, they're probably not going to notice much difference. Okay, let's see what else we have. Daniel says, ideally, I want a body like a physique athlete. What kind of rep ranges should I be aiming for? The rep ranges are really going to depend on the exercises you're doing and, of course, the program you're following. Now, as far as achieving a physique like a physique athlete, that's basically kind of come from two things. Building enough muscle so that you have the muscle mass of a physique athlete and then losing excess body fat so that you have the definition of a physique athlete. Uh, the actual repetition ranges... You, you can use a lot of different rep ranges, and, and you will use a lot of rep ranges in working towards that goal. Uh, the general guideline that I like to recommend for, for most people, if you're just doing, again, a, a generalized workout program, is lower reps for your bigger, heavier compound exercises, moderate reps for your mid-range exercises, and higher reps for your isolation exercises. Again, that's, that's a very blanket broad statement, but it works for most programs. So for example, things like your, your bench presses, your squats, your deadlifts, your heavy rows, your overhead presses, less than 10 reps usually works well. You know, you might do something like a five by five program, or maybe, you know, you're in that like uh, five to eight repetition range for these big heavy exercises. Some uh, mid range compound exercises, uh, you know, like lat pull downs, um, dumbbell bench presses, um, barbell curls, th things of that nature. You'll probably be in that 10 to 12 repetition range for, for your, your mid range, your, your moderate weight exercises. And then your lighter isolation exercises, you know, like lateral raises, tricep kickbacks, calf raises, abdominal work, things like that. You probably want to go higher in that 12 to 15 or even higher rep range. So again, those are some general guidelines. Um, I have a, an article on my blog. If you do a Google search for Lee Hayward, how many reps should you do to build muscle? It actually breaks this down, breaks down the exercises and the rep ranges, kind of similar to what I just did there, but in more detail. So if you want to check that out, just do a Google search for Lee Hayward, how many reps should you do to build muscle? And it'll, you should find that article. Alan is joining us, and he says, thanks for your time and wisdom. I really like your last Q&A about how you can lose weight and gain muscle at the same time, and dieting is nothing new. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it, Alan. Glad you enjoy the videos. Uh, Swires is saying, like the video, guys. I do appreciate the support. Thank you much. 
Nazim, one of our regulars, is joining us again. It says, Lee, my question is regarding push-ups. We do them, palms flat on the floor. I saw a video where the trainer said it's better to use push-up stands to do it uh, with the fist on the floor is one better than the other. Good question. I actually have some push-up related videos explaining this and instead of using push-up handles I'm actually using hex dumbbells. The, the hexagon shaped dumbbells which work really good as push-up handles because they're not going to roll like a regular round plate dumbbell will. The difference between doing push-ups flat on the floor versus holding a handle generally speaking most people are going to find the handle easier on the wrist it's going to place your hand in a more comfortable position. It's going to allow you to get a deeper range of motion, meaning you'll be able to sink down deeper in the bottom. And chances are you're actually going to get more repetitions than if you do them with your hands flat on the floor. Uh, it's, it's something that you'll have to just try. I mean, tr if you have hex dumbbells or you have push-up stand handles, try both ways. Try with your feet or <laughs> your feet, your hands flat on the floor and <laughs> see how that works for you and try then holding the handles and see what feels better. Most people will like the handles better, I, I think. I mean, I, I, mo most people that I've recommended it to usually prefer the handles better. Uh, so it, that's, that's all it is. I mean, now the downside of it is it's not as quick and convenient. Like if, if you're just doing push-ups with your hands flat on the floor, I mean, you can do them anywhere, right? You can just I can jump down on the floor right now and do a set of push-ups, hands flat on the floor. You know, if, if you're in the gym and you want to like superset push-ups in between your exercises, you can just hit the floor anywhere and bang out a set of push-ups. And most of the time, that's what I'll do. I'll just do them palms on the floor because it, you know, it's it's not that big of a deal. I can do them comfortably either way. But if I was going to like max out and see how many push-ups I could do, I would get higher reps if I use the handles versus if I did them flat, palms on the floor. And not a lot. I mean, you might get an extra you know, four or five reps if you did them, you know, with the handles versus palms on the floor. But still, I mean, if, if you're trying to just do a all out max effort set, you, you would notice a difference. John is joining us and he says, Lee, hope you and family are doing well. Do you still work, uh, work out with the missus? <laughs> How has your workouts changed with age, family and raising a child? Yeah, things have changed a lot. Um, a lot of times I'm working out solo and not working out with the missus as often. Uh, and the reason is, is because we have to have somebody looking after the baby. So a lot of times uh, I'm, I'm usually working out by myself. Sometimes we'll get a babysitter and she'll join me at the gym, but it's it's not nearly as, it's not like it was back in the, in the pre-baby days when we had all the time to ourselves and we were priority one. That's, that's one of the things you're going to notice. I mean, and, and of course, for the parents out there who are watching this, you know darn well that as soon as you have a baby, you drop down on the priority rank big time. You're no longer the priority. You are a second-class citizen, and baby is priority one. <laughs> so that's where things have been. And I find it, it's, it's a lot harder. It's, it's, it takes more time and effort and, and structure and planning in order to get to the gym than it did before. Uh, I found when I, before we had the baby, we, we could work out any time. It was easy. Again, we didn't have to plan or structure. And now with the baby, everything is a big ordeal. Like even if it's it's to go to the grocery store, I mean, we have to plan it out. And, and you know, you just can't jump in the car and go. Like if, if we're going to go, like, for example, as a family, okay, well, we got to get the baby ready. We got to get them changed. We got to take it. Get, make sure we got an extra diaper and we got an extra change of clothes for him. Okay, we got to get his bottle. We got to get this and that. And we got to pack up the car and have everything ready, you know, to just make a simple trip to the store. It, it's just, there's no spontaneity anymore. I mean, everything has to be planned and structured. And of course, that's the same with, with going to the gym as well. Uh, so uh, it takes a lot more work to, to plan it out. And sometimes I'm working out at odd hours, either like really early in the morning or really late at night to try and just fit it in after everything else is done. So still getting it done, still making progress, but it's a lot harder than it used to be. Okay, what else? Another quick question. When I squat, my right foot flares out a bit compared to my left foot. Is that an issue? I don't feel any discomfort or pain. Should I be worried? 
well, it's good that you're aware of that. But the big thing, if you're not feeling any comfort or uh, pain, it's probably not a big deal. I would definitely keep an eye on it and, and just see. But as long as you can squat with, with good technique and, and pain-free, that's a good sign. Uh, one thing you could experiment with is different footwear, you know, to see, I don't know what kind of shoes you, you wear when you squat, but uh, there, there's two basic types of shoes that you should squat with. Uh, one is either a flat sole shoe, something like a Chuck Taylor's Converse type of sneaker, something with a, a, a wide flat base that provides really good grip. And that's one option. Another option is to squat with a shoe that has a hard heel like a proper squat shoe. I mean, you'll see like a lot of power lifters or Olympic lifters squatting in these proper squat shoes that have that hard heel. And usually the heel is actually made of wood. So there's no give or compression to it. That, those are the two types of shoes that you should squat in if you are looking for proper footwear. I try and avoid squatting in running shoes or something that has that soft, cushy uh, heel and, and that soft, cushy arch because that can sometimes throw off uh, your squat, you know, because as you're squatting down and, and the, the sneakers are compressing under you, under the load, uh, it might throw your technique off a bit. And also, if you're squatting with a wider stance, there's also more of a risk of you rolling your ankles if you're squatting in a soft shoe, especially as it's compressing under the load. So a flat sole shoe, again, something along the lines of, of a Chuck Taylor Converse. I mean, there's, there's a lot of similar knockoff brands out there that are just as good from a, a workout shoe point of view. Um, I, I'm just, the ones that I've been working out in lately are just some no-name flat sole shoe. Uh, I picked them up. I, I tell you what, I picked these up at Walmart a couple years back, and I just said, look, I just need a cheap shoe for when I'm out doing some like yard work and like painting the patio and stuff like that. It's a pair of shoes that I don't give a shit about. The, you know, if I, if I ruin them, if I get them covered in paint or whatever, who cares? So I bought these cheap shoes at Walmart for, for that, just doing stuff out in the garden for painting and all that. And uh, they were really comfortable. So I said, geez, you know, these, these are pretty cool. So I ended up wearing them to the gym and I did a workout in them. I said, man, these are really good workout shoes. I mean, there's nothing fancy but they're just a good solid flat sole shoe, really good grip on the gym floor. And I found like for squats and, and calf raises and anything that I needed good grip for, they were a really good shoe. So the shoes that I'm currently working out in right now are like these cheap, no name, $20 Walmart shoes. And they just happen to be really good workout shoes. I mean, it's kind of rare that it works out that way because you usually get what you pay for when it comes to sneakers. But this one, I actually hooked into a, a good shoe that's, that, that um, I actually like it. So I actually saved them for workout shoes rather than using them as old garbage work shoes. So that's what I'm training in now, but it's a flat sole shoe. All right, let's move on. Let's see what other questions we've got. Uh, Azim's got a question saying, this one's regarding barbell curls. In the negative portion, how must I extend my arm all the way to the end? If not, how much must I extend? That's really a personal preference thing. You can still do a partial curl, meaning not going all the way down to full extension, and you can still get a good contraction in the biceps. Uh, I, I'm kind of just my, my nature. I like doing a full range of motion for most exercises. So I'll usually let my arms go all the way down in the bottom. Uh, sometimes I will even purposely flex the triceps in the bottom of a curl to really get that full stretch in the bicep and then yeah, you know, get the full peak contraction. So, you know, again, I, I've seen guys do it both ways where they're keeping constant tension in the biceps, not letting the barbell go all the way down. And then I've seen other guys go to the full extreme of lowering it all the way down and even so much as flexing the tricep in the bottom so that they're totally extending the, uh, you know, stretching up the bicep muscle. I've seen it work both ways. So, Bottom line, do what works the best for you. And if you really don't have a preference, then you could cycle back and forth. I mean, maybe like do a few weeks of partial curls and a few weeks of doing full range curls. And you can just see what works the best for you. Uh, will you ever do a collaboration with other fitness YouTubers? You did it before. I think I can say this on behalf of everyone here that you 
that you do it again once in a while. Yes, I, I would definitely be up for doing collaborations. It's just the, for me, location is a big thing. Now, I do have some more travel plans in the future, um, just due to my, my business and the things that I'm working on now. I'm going to be doing some more travel. In fact, um, the end of early October, I'm going to be heading to Vancouver for, uh, again, it's for a, a seminar. Uh, so it's only like a weekend seminar thing, but I'm heading to Vancouver in uh, early October, and then early November I'm heading to New York for another seminar that I'm going to be attending. So during those trips, I may end up doing some collaboration videos, depending on who I meet up with. But for the most part, the reason why I don't do a lot of collaboration videos with other fitness YouTubers is because where I live here in, in, in Newfoundland, there aren't many other fitness YouTubers. There are some like small, small YouTubers, like literally guys who some local bodybuilders may post up their videos, but they probably even have like less than a thousand subscribers. So I mean, really small and uh, nothing against that. We all have to start somewhere. But as far as like big fitness YouTubers, there, there are none in Newfoundland. Like I'm the biggest fitness YouTuber in, in Newfoundland at the moment. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I would definitely be up for doing collaborations, especially workout videos. It's just fun to do that. Um, but yeah, it's something that's definitely, definitely in the future for sure. Put it that way. Okay. Roger says he really appreciates the weekly streams. Thank you very much. And you're welcome, Roger. I'm glad you enjoy them. Uh, Amar's joining us saying, Lee, could you give me advice on improving pull-ups? Should I do weighted or always improve my technique? I would focus on the technique and the repetitions over the weight when it comes to body weight exercises. Uh, you, you can make a lot of progress with body weight pull-ups. You know, I mean, yes, if, if, if you're to the point where you're banging out pull-ups with your body weight and it's just a joke, like 20 plus reps is, is, is a, you know, nothing. And you just find that you got oodles of strength left in the tank, then yeah, okay, start adding weight. That makes sense. But for most guys, body weight is going to be enough. More often than not. I mean, in my case, I don't do weighted pull-ups. I just do body weight, and I'll just focus on more sets and reps. I'll try and increase the volume. And if you if you want to make it harder, slow down the tempo. You know, do them in a slower cadence, or really try and hold that peak contraction at the top, like hold the top of the pull-up. Or even not just pull up to the point where you're getting your chin over the bar, pull it up so you're actually touching your chest to the bar. Things like that can make the exercise a lot harder, increase the muscle activation and muscle stimulation without increasing the weight. So I would focus on the quality over the weight when it comes to body weight exercises. And, and for that matter, I mean, that applies to all exercises. I mean, focus on the quality before you add weight. Uh, but again, especially with the body weight ones. All right, another question here uh, on off days. Can I do push-ups, inverted rows from time to time, or will that significantly reduce my strength on the following day? It really depends. If you are very consistent with your training, you're, you're the type of guy who's in the gym, you're pushing yourself hard, you are consistent, you're not skipping workouts, then doing extra exercise like that on your off days may slow down your recovery because if you are very consistent and, and placing a lot of demands on your body, you need those off days for rest and recovery. On the other hand, if you're kind of like on and off again with your workouts, you know, you're, you're more likely you're, or you're just as likely to skip a gym day as you are to actually make it to the gym, then throwing in extra body weight exercises like that at home can be a way to help increase your workout consistency and thus increase your progress. So it really depends on the individual and, and how dedicated and committed you are to your workout routine. So you use it with that. If, if you're super committed and you are pushing yourself hard and, and heavy in the gym, then on your off days, make it an off day. If, if you want to do something like, like a, you know, low intensity cardio or some stretching or something like that, that's fine. But I wouldn't be going and doing, uh, you know, high intensity body weight exercises because that will hinder your recovery. Uh, as an intermediate lifter, is it important to be strong both in lower and higher rep ranges? Yes, and what you'll find is as you get stronger in one, the other will get stronger as well. More often than not, I mean, it's, it's 
if, if you see someone like who can, who's really strong in the low rep ranges, chances are they're also going to be stronger in a higher rep range. It, it, it usually correlates. Now, there are some exceptions depending on, on your body type and, and your muscle fiber type. Like some people are more uh, muscular endurance related. Some people are more power related, but that's kind of like a genetic trait more so than, than a, uh, something that's going to be trained for. Uh, but more often than not, you will notice as you get stronger in one rep range, that should carry over to your other rep ranges as well. I'll give you a prime example of this to, to kind of drive this point home. I remember uh, a few years back, we, uh, this is a good many years back, we had a bench press for reps competition at one of our local bodybuilding shows. And the guy who won it at the time was a competitive power lifter and he always did low reps, never did high reps at all. I mean, like five by five, uh, you know, or, or sometimes pyramiding up to doing heavy singles and stuff like that. But this guy, I, I don't think he ever did anything more than 10 reps in, in a set with his powerlifting training ever. Like if it was 10 reps, that was just like a warm up set. And then everything else was just pyramiding up in weight. And anyway, we had body weight for reps, bench press competition. And he put his body, or he, he put his body weight on the barbell. And I think he repped it out for like over 50 reps. I mean, it was just blew everybody out of the water at that, this competition. And he never, ever trained high reps. All he did was heavy, low reps, but he was a very strong bench presser. I mean, he was a bench press specialist. Uh, and, and even though he never trained high reps, when he did rep out with high reps, he still like smoked everyone because for his body type and his strength level, the body weight was such a light weight for him that he could just pump it out for, for high reps. So again, if you get stronger in one, you're going to get stronger in the other. It's, it's the, your strength is going to carry through in all the different rep ranges. All right, let's see what else we have. Every, this is from Yep. <laughs> this is the username, Yep. Uh, everything is improving, but the waste is not. Is this just something to do with hormones, or is it due to cortisol? Any ideas on doing fasting till 12, no waste reduction? If you're training for fat loss and you are a guy, the waste is going to be one of the, the slowest areas to lose. If like I can just tell you this now. I mean, this so you, you just wrap your head around this. You're going to get leaner in your chest, in your arms, in your legs. You're going to get leaner in all these other body part areas, but that spare tire around the middle is going to be the last to go. That's just the way it is. That is your stubborn body fat for guys. Um, very few exceptions. That's that's usually the way it is. So, I mean, you might have vascularity and striations and definition in your chest, arms, shoulders. You might be able to flex your quads and see, you know, cuts and, and separation in your quads and you still have a roll of belly fat hanging over your your your, your uh, belt right that's that's just the way it is the, the the belly fat the waist is going to be the slowest to go so if you're getting leaner all over like you're, you're doing everything you're following your diet you're you're doing your training consistently and you're losing fat everywhere else keep doing what you're doing it's it all it is is you have to uh, diet longer in order to tap into that stubborn body fat in the midsection. So, uh, you know, that, that's my strategy for that is just diet longer. And uh, that, that's, that's a common trait for, for all the guys. All right. What else have we got? Jesse's asking, what gum are you chewing in your workout videos? If, if I'm chewing gum, it's, it's usually a nicotine gum, actually. And I did a video on this. A lot of people think, nicotine gum, what, are you a smoker? No, I'm not a smoker. But nicotine in moderation is actually a, um, it, it's like an alternative for coffee, if you will. Because uh, nicotine can have that similar type of, of performance enhancement, just like a cup of coffee can, like moderate amounts of caffeine. Uh, the thing I like about nicotine is it improves your reaction time, it curbs your appetite, it does give you that mental pick-me-up, similar as coffee, or, or caffeine, I should say, but it's in and out of your system quicker. So a lot of times, if I'm training later at night, and I want a little pre-workout pick-me-up, but I don't want to drink a cup of coffee, or I don't want to take a caffeine pill, because I'm afraid I'll be up and wired all night long, I'll chew a piece of nicotine gum. And that's enough to give me that short-term 
energy boost and again that mental focus and concentration but it's not going to hinder my sleep it's not going to keep me awake and wired so that's why i'll sometimes chew a piece of nicotine gum if i'm working out later in the evening or if i just don't want to have caffeine like i, I purposely try and cut down on my caffeine consumption by now i know this might sound like totally off the wall for some people uh, but i have a video uh, do a search for for lee hayward nicotine gum if you want to uh, see more about this and do some research on it it's actually like a lot of people are thinking oh my god you're going to get cancer and all this but the the, the, the cancer causing or the the negative aspects of like tobacco and all that and smoking it's not the nicotine it's actually the smoke and the, the other toxins and that that are involved with it the nicotine aspect of it if you isolate it as in a nicotine gum it's actually no more harmful than for example like the caffeine and a cup of coffee and it's kind of like on the on par with that so that's if you're wondering what kind of gum I'm chewing in a in a workout video sometimes, and that's what it is, and that's for the very reason because I'm trying to cut down on the caffeine. All right, I'm probably going to get ready and clue this up very shortly because we've been going for over an hour. Uh, let's see, I'll probably take one more question. One that just came through. Mm, what are some good pre-workout foods to eat before a workout? This is from LX Beltran. Good pre-workout foods. If you have a couple options. First off, you, you probably don't need to eat anything. A lot of people can actually work out and function fine with, without any food in their system. And I, I'm kind of of that nature most of the time. Uh, if I'm working out earlier in the day, I'll usually go to the gym on an empty stomach. I may have a cup of coffee, you know, something like that, and that's usually enough. Um, if I'm working out later in the day, I will usually have uh, something to eat before I work out. Uh, but it, it, it depends. Like, you don't really need a pre-workout meal. Uh, for example, if you have, you're on a regular meal structure, and you had your regular food, and then you wait an hour or so after that and then go to the gym, you, you probably don't need anything special before you go to the gym because the food that you've eaten for your previous meal will have had time to uh, digest and, and get absorbed and you know, you'll be able to run off that, if you will. If I am gonna have anything before a workout, like let's just say I'm really hungry and I need to have something in me to run on, but I don't want it to kind of like hinder my performance in the gym or anything heavy and sluggish that's gonna sit on my stomach, I'll have something light, like a piece of fruit and maybe a protein shake. Just something that's very quick and easy to di digest, and it's not going to sit heavy on the stomach. Uh, I would avoid anything that is uh, has a lot of fat in it, uh, anything that takes a lot of time to digest. I try and avoid that. So something that's very quick and easy to digest. Again, protein shake and a piece of fruit, that's very simple and easy to digest. Uh, you know, That's usually what I would have as a pre-workout meal. Uh, it's just... Again, keep it simple. And the, the main thing, like, you know, a lot of people place emphasis on, okay, your, your pre-workout meal or your post-workout meal. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not, not saying that they're not important because they, they do play a role in your overall progress. But the most important is your overall nutrition. What are you consuming over the course of, say, like a 24-hour period or even longer than that? What are you consuming over the course of a week, over a month? I mean, your long-term nutrition is, is so much more important than what you eat right before a workout or what you eat right after a workout. Your overall average and being consistent over the long term with good quality nutrition and making sure that you're eating adequate amounts for your personal fitness goals, be that building muscle or burning body fat or a combination of both, whatever it is that you're training for, having your long-term nutrition in line with that, that's going to be the, the most important thing. I mean, even if you never focused on pre and post workout nutrition, but you had your long-term nutrition in place, you'd still make progress towards your goals. Even if you've never had a post-workout shake or you never took a pre-workout or anything like that, but you focus on your overall nutrition, you would still make progress. That's what's most important. You know, the, the pre and post-workout nutrition, that's kind of like icing on the cake. That's just a little, a little something extra that you can throw in there or to help, you know, squeeze out a little bit more progress. But like the 95% the that's gonna have the biggest impact is going to be your overall fundamental nutrition and then you know five percent is going to be like your your pre and post workout 
All right, guys, I'm going to get ready and clue it up. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for the questions. And, of course, thank you for the support. I really enjoy it. And I will uh, have the replay of this posted up within the next 24 hours along with the timestamps so that you can go through the replay and find the individual questions that you want to uh, focus in on. So I'll, go, I'll have that done within the next 24 hours. Have yourself a fantastic weekend. And I look forward to chatting with you next Friday. And in the meantime, if you would like some help with your workout or nutrition program, if you have anything that you would like some one-on-one -on -one time with, with me about, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. This is something that I, I'm offering. And again, it's, it's totally free. Uh, what it is, it's an opportunity for us to get on the phone and discuss your individual situation, your challenges, your goals, what it is that you want to achieve one-on-one. -on -one. We'll have a 20-minute conversation and see if you are a good fit for my coaching program. And I mean, if, if you are, then I'll be more than happy to work with you and help you reach your personal fitness goals. And if, if I feel that we're not a good fit, then I'll try and point you in the right direction to what can help you achieve your goals. So if you would like that, you would like to have a one-on-one 20-minute -on -one coaching call, head on over to my website, leehayward.com, and click on the link in the top menu bar that says coaching, and you can sign up for a free 20-minute coaching call with me. And we'll come up with some realistic strategies to help you move towards your fitness goals. So go ahead, do that, and I will talk to you in the next video chat. Take care. Over and out.